73% of the capacity of, it, of the embalse, of the reservoir, is gone due to sedimentation from Hurricane George that was never removed and Hurricane Maria. 73%. When you go out there, you will see a log just stop there, and you're wondering, how can this matter? How can this happen? There's little wind, it should be moving around. No, it's because it's so shallow now that a branch from that log is stuck in the mud and it doesn't move. That's how much of the reservoir capacity has been lost. So we will, we, again, this is a, also a first, and, and we are the only community-based organization that has, it actually gives me a little chills just remembering this. The 1st of July of this past year, we submitted the first statement of qualifications of a community-based organization to participate in any of the RFP processes. When you look at that, as Edwin well knows, all of those are ex external, you know, let's face it, all U.S. citizens, right? You know, they all have their American divisions, Siemens has their American divisions, and there are allies. You know, Avoid has their, their uh, U.S. company as well. But the fact of the matter is that, that no longer does Puerto Rico have the talent or the skill or the know-how to actually rebuild in these plants, which is why we, we have these excellent allies that we're very, very thankful to have. Um, uh, because nobody, there's no manufacturing capability that can produce a 21st century turbine or a generator in Puerto Rico. That, we, just have, we just need to accept that that's where we're at for that island in terms of its capacity. So we will take that, 43 megawatts, we will improve it by minimum 10%. We're shooting for 15%, which would give us peak capacity of production of about 47 megawatts. Utuado consumes 4 megawatts. Adjuntas consumes 3 megawatts. Hajuja, which is small, consumes 4 megawatts because of Abbott and, um, and the other pharma company, Baxter, gracias. Um, so those two companies get that production up. That, that just shows you the difference that industrial consumption makes in terms of, in terms, in terms of uh, uh, total consumption. That's higher math for me. I usually have to run a calculator, but that shows 11 megawatts, right? Those plant, now just think about this. This could be 47 megawatts, 11 megawatts consumption. We're talking about dozens of megawatts contributed to the grid, requiring millions of dollars back to the cooperative, which means we can actually do economic development for a region that is long time needed. We can actually give a competitive reason to that young man that is selling water bottles at the intersection of Highway 22 and the, or 10 into Guado. We can give him a compelling reason to get a better job and stay in the community and build it. We can give a better community, and it's very sad to admit, one of my fantastic project coordinators has made a decision now to move to the United States. She was unemployed in Oduado for two years. Fantastic skills, impressive young mother, and now she has to leave. Because there just isn't those opportunities there in Oduado. And, and mind you, that's not because we don't intend to keep her on board, it's just actually with the job that we were able to give her, give her she actually took her family on a vacation for the first time. And then she comes to the United States and sees the good roads. She knows that her, stu her, her, her children go without education on the daily. If a teacher gets sick in Puerto Rico, they cancel class for the entire group of children. There's no substitute teachers. That's the impact of education cutbacks. You have no extra capacity to cover that. So when the teacher goes sick, 30 children go back home. This is not sustainable, and she knows that as a young mother, and she has a duty, and I encourage her to be honest, because her children de depend on a better future, and she deserves a better future, so we support that kind of movement, unfortunately, but that's the reality. So, so when we look at that, so that's, that's the hydroelectric project, where we can actually do business-to-business -business economic development without a single handout from the government, none of those failed models. I came to Puerto Rico in March 2017, Maria changed my life, different story. But the point is, I remember going to Fomento, and Fomento would say, oh, we'll give you this building for $1 for a year, or we'll give you use of this land for $1 for a year. But guess what, you're not talking a business person's perspective, that's the least of my concerns. My concerns are human capital, and consistent electricity, and consistent water. Mm -hmm. Can you give me anything with there? No, we can't do anything with that. 
Yeah. So that's the issue. So, so th that's some of the reality we have. So we can do business to business, business development for a region that is ongoing. In complement that, we have our Proyecto Renfoco. <coughs> Renfoco stands for, uh, it's an acronym, it's, I have to remember this, Residencia Comunitaria Energetica Fotovoltaica, right? But anybody that is good with their high school Spanish or better, Renfoco also means refocus. And that's exactly what we're doing. It's refocusing on those communities, those barrios, that went without electricity for 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 plus months. And what we will do is we will install 5 megawatts of distributed rooftop solar in phases of blocks of 1 megawatt each. Across That represents about 1,250 installations, if my math is right. Not including, we have to probably reduce it if we're talking about businesses and others. And we're going to do this and we're going to install these in strategic locations. Now, what do we mean by strategic locations? Well, if you go to the government, they'll talk about the fire station, that's an hour away. They'll talk about the police station, that's 45 minutes away. They'll talk about the hospital that in Utuado closed and then reopened. That's what they call it, critical infrastructure. You know what we call critical infrastructure? The panaderia that was at the intersection of the highway. That tire station, that automotive repair, and that cormado, that little store, that's the critical infrastructure, because what we saw from our disaster relief is when the intersection of those highways, the people would come down from the barrios and they would want to find out, how's Doña Fela doing? How's Don Rodriguez? How can we help them out? And by doing that, when we install that critical infrastructure, now when the grid fails, and it will fail, again, at least those people will be able to go down there and do what? Have a little refrigerator? so they can put their medicine, so the insulin will be preserved longer. They'll be able to go down there and connect up the apparatus so they can give their child their asthma therapy. They'll go down there and do something as simple as charging their cell phones to feel connected to the 21st century, to be able to receive emergency information, to be able to talk to the diaspora, to let them know we're alive, we're okay, we're gonna make it better. Sorry. <laughs> Residente en energía fotovoltaica comunitaria. Is acronym. My acronym. So uh, there's a whole lot of things going on, and I've been supporting CV for over a year in these efforts as part of the activity of the best young. But he doesn't have a beer. But are you going to talk to him? No. I don't have a beer either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have two, two free clip ons for both. <laughs> Course. There have been some great projects that have come up, uh, you know, over the course, responding to the immediate need for recovery. Uh, you know, people like uh, Brazilian Power Puerto Rico, the team with Aramana, to uh, getting facilities into place, and the other kind of critical infrastructure, community centers within uh, um, uh, Blue Planet Energy and the Red Cross and FEMA and other uh, projects to put uh, solar and batteries and things at police stations. I mean, this is all very important in terms of immediate response. Um, now, from a, a long term perspective, none of these things, though very important, are uh, basically uh, scalable, replicable, or sustainable. Right? They all require philanthropic capital, they all require you know, people to. Uh, you know, sacrifice somewhere else in order to, to make this happen. When I look at things, when we look at things in the Fundacion, we're looking at things that, that meet all of those criteria and you know, contribute to economic development. I think the thing that, that uh, again, to be, to be our own horn, uh, our first major uh, program, funded program, let's say, we're, we're working on a shoestring to do a number of things, but uh, we created um, the Puerto Rico Energy Capital Access Program and uh, we're very pleased to receive a large grant from the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture Rural Development Group. This is uh, going to receive a lot of scrutiny. It is the largest grant for this program by several multiples that has been provided uh, to Puerto Rico. They've got the support of all of the uh, state director in Puerto Rico as well as the national director for uh, rural development. The basic theme of this particular program is to you know, create conditions, momentum, where, in the words of the grant, we're providing 
uh, financial education and technical assistance. What we're really doing is we're creating a financial advisory and project development group that can yeah. sit down and work hand in hand with groups in uh, the communities, uh, municipalities, and probably most of the people are going to be businesses uh, looking for microgrids, solar installations, we're hoping to see some biomass and a few other types, so it shouldn't necessarily be all about solar, but that's the low-hanging fruit. And we'll be working with uh, these groups in two cohorts next year, uh, helping them uh, identify and understand and learn about potential sources of capital, whether it's uh, you know the USDA for a loan, uh, looking for private markets. Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, the Cooperativa uh, will be one of the cohort members, and uh, we'll be working with them to help them create a, a profile and understanding, a project package that meets the you know, worldwide norms required to access capital. If you don't have, as CP was saying, a great deal of depth and understanding of you know, basic items like, like credit, right? Um, you know, how do you build a creditworthy structure around the project? How do you put your particular desire into a framework for um, an RFP, if what, not what you're seeking isn't a loan, but you're seeking someone to come in and build, own, uh, transfer, operate, however you best want to do it. You've got to be able to speak to uh, investors and lenders and others in a language that they understand and meet the thresholds and hurdles that they require in order to access capital. There's virtually no skill in Puerto Rico to do that, and virtually no capital that is native in Puerto Rico. So we need to be looking outside. Now, if we start with this, uh, we can also counter some of the perceptions that persist in terms of you know, the Puerto Rican market, right? I mean, how many of you have talked to someone and you know, they've said, oh, Puerto Rico is a bad republic, or, oh, it's too poor, it's too hard, uh, you know, I don't see enough visibility in deals. That part's true. The uh, ability to create, through this program and others, uh, a group of projects that meet those, those standards and those norms, and you're creating a different perception in terms of what's possible in Puerto Rico that momentum. That success uh, will also hopefully lead to an acceleration and creation of homegrown sources of capital. Uh, I've talked to several people already uh, out there in the private market uh, from the finance industry, some of them uh, worked here in the US, uh, mainland US, some in Puerto Rico, but there are two or three groups who are actually thinking about putting together uh, lease funds or PPA funds or other things that are actually they're homegrown, right? Uh, the cooperativa, uh, sorry, financial cooperatives and the banks are now starting to do more than pay lip service to the idea of providing solar loans for businesses and homeowners and others. Um, strangely enough, because they've actually discovered there may be some profit in it. <laughs> All the things that we do, including creating these examples through this program, uh, are going to help that end. Um, you know, we'll bring these people in, show them the opportunities. We may find that some of these programs in the cohorts become some of the first qualified borrowers under some of the homegrown stuff that's coming out. So this is kind of the big thing that we're working on. This is, to some extent, the program, the first funded program that will help us launch what we're doing into a, a much greater, and like CP, I also end every conversation with what you guys do to help us. So. Well, I, I want to say two, two things to this discussion. One, we're doing finance projects, microgrid in Haiti, um, solar uh, water pumping on the island of Cebu in the Philippines, privately financed, uh, communications and lighting systems in Ethiopia and Somalia. These places are way poor than Puerto Rico. Way poor. Not even that Puerto Rico would be considered rich with that harsh description that you just gave, and rightly so. So, the issue really is, as I said in my first talk, we have economic technologies that could be in for clean water and electricity, um, less than what Puerto Rico pays now. 
Uh, we have some great actors who are trying to orchestrate the organizations to receive money and the projects to do. Um, one of the new innovations that has really come out as a result of the internet is crowdfunding. And, you know, it started as little tiny projects. We did little village lighting systems in Uganda, and, you know, we got a couple of grand each from different people. Now we're doing giant projects that are $400,000 to several million dollars. There are people and entities willing to invest <clears throat> and get a return on their money looking on the internet. And the diaspora in the Puerto Rico here is a perfect venue to try to figure out where you have great, great actors who are actually doing something, and are doing something, by the way, in my lifetime, which is very important, and, 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 and some skills in how to access and ensure projects will be economically viable to orchestrate dollars so that you can get a return on your money better than any CD in any bank so, and really have changed the impact on the island or the organization or company that you work for to do some of that. And by the way, more and more businesses are doing things like this. So all I want to throw out here, and there's a great project, this organic power project of two megawatt uh, waste to biogas to electricity plant in, uh, I think it's Vega Puerto Rico, uh, is, I mean, just fabulous. I mean, you're an island. You have all this waste. Where the hell are you going to put the waste? So let's make it into energy in a environmentally sound way. And by the way, when things degrade to methane, methane is even uh, 20 times more potent than carbon if you're dealing with greenhouse gases. So in the end, we have economic solutions, and we have pathways for dollars to make things happen. And I think what I hope from this, and why I'm here, was really to empower you to support not only these two up here at the table, but others, in, and create some new economic solutions that these are not donations. These are investments, where money is to be made but for the long-term health of Puerto Rico. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so what I'd like to talk about now is the impact that the privatization of Beba could potentially have on Puerto Rico's energy future. Do you see it as endangering the energy future? And how will you respond in particular, this question came in for you, CP. How would you respond to comparatives um, and their role in, is it just another privatization of energy? So, um, I just got sent to me an invitation from the Plaza of Utuado. There's going to be a group of concerned citizens that are going to come together to discuss this. and. Uh, and what, what amused me is the title of their, of their, uh, of their little community, and we know them, these are agitators. Um, um, this is like the, the true people that come together, you know, like they start chismeando, and then, and then pretty soon, it just, they show up at, every, not our meetings, we've actually been very lucky, but they show up at everybody else's meetings, and uh, makes it a little uncomfortable for them. But the funny thing that amused me was their title was, the possible privatization, the possible privatization. And it amused me because it's not possible. It's happening. It, it's actually required. Uh, it, Jose Ortiz, just uh, who's in charge of uh, PREPA, actually came out and said, PREPA is getting out of the energy production business. Period. Mm -hmm. Private is going to be privatized. So, so, so the, 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 for the cooperative to actually acquire the hydroelectric plants, PREPA privatizing is a condition for success. It's not a barrier. What is a barrier when it comes to PREPA is the fact that they're no longer a good partner. They are so understaffed. So we are, again, the only community organization that's going to these Negociado de Energia, the Energy Bureau, workshops. So you go there and you find maybe a half dozen PREPA people there, then you have moneyed interests that show up there, so you'll find all these very narrow interests, kind of like investment representatives or business opportunities, they'll show up in these workshops. 
And then there's really no community representation, and certainly nobody representing the interests of the center of the attic. So, so we show up there, we're participating in these workshops faithfully. I actually have one of our project coordinators that, that in addition to her other duties, she attends that with one of our board members from the board of directors from the Cooperativa. And it is embarrassing to see PREPA show up at these meetings. They are so woefully unprepared for the privatization, and that you can actually hear it in the frustration of the commissioners when they ask questions from them when they cannot actually have the answer. An answer, mind you, by the way, that the Energy Bureau had already asked them to prepare for for this one workshop. So, so I think my biggest concern about PREPA is not that they're privatizing, I believe that is actually a good for the public. Uh, I think that the challenges we need to have for the future role of PREPA, uh, which will be more in the terms of a facilitator and a steward of the titles of these resources. So for example, even though they're passing on to uh, the, the private um, uh, the, the grid, the trans distribution and transmission, even though that's going to be in the hands of you know, the maintained and also built for it from a private institution, the fact of the matter is that they'll hold on to the title for reasons that they can access federal funding when a, a disaster happens, right? So they'll be the steward of those titles. The fact of the matter is that they're not a good partner, and I think that's my biggest concern about PREPA. Yeah, I would, I would just say that uh, I, I agree. I think the, the, the danger here is in the way that the, the government is handling the transformation of the industry, right? Privatization is an absolute precondition to the transformation and revitalization and economic development of Puerto Rico. You know, if you don't privatize, if you, if you leave it back in the hands and you go back to the old ways, uh, you know, you, you won't have the last guy to leave Puerto Rico wanted to turn the lights on because they won't be on. Right? So, if you just think about it, I've, I, by the way, I mean, over 30 years, I've, I've privatized markets, I've privatized generation, you know, through financial and advisory uh, in um, every continent but Antarctica, right? And and just so people don't get the idea that it's all one way, I've actually worked with, with state-owned companies to actually take over private infrastructure that, that wasn't working, right? The condition in Puerto Rico right now, right, is such that there is no transparency and no accountability, right? So, you know, if, if you are the decision maker, the operator, and, you know, the, the customer, right, there's the, the guys who are actually in charge. PREPA doesn't work for the people of Puerto Rico. It's a cancer sucking the life out of Puerto Rico. It's operated for the unions, the employees, the management, and the politicians, right? So you need to privatize, you need to break it up. You can take that word privatize, and you don't have to make it this, this nasty thing about people coming in off the island and stealing the crown jewels. Uh, it's really about accountability and transparency, right? We could set this up, I mean, I could construct a system, yes? They're just optimizing these resources. Right now, there's no incentive whatsoever to make these optimal or more efficient, right. period. Correct. I think um, this is part of a, a global trend, by the way. So this is not just Puerto Rico. In the United, on the mainland here, we've been privatizing generation for the last 60 years. When I cut hair in my head, like most of you in this room, utilities uh, financed and generated all their power, 100%. Uh, as of 1995, it was 50%, meaning private companies come in and build a plant and they just sign a 20-year contract for the power. And now most of the solar, the wind, the biomass, the geothermal projects in the world are financed by private companies or investment groups. And again, the utility just moves the electrons around. What we also need, because they are so, um, let's just say bumbling, I'm trying to be nice, is to have other kinds of entities, whether it's co-ops, or community microgrids, or industrial parks, commercial campuses, government campuses, whatever the, the institutions are, to be able to take that investment, distribute it to the folks within the confines, and then maybe set it on the grid for the rest of it to be moved around and create a transparent way to do it. 
but we have to bring this down so it's more locally. And it's happening all over the world. So the good news is this isn't an aberration. This is part of a trend. And the issue is how do we co-opt the trend so it, it vastly improves the lives and economy of the people on Puerto Rico. Great. Uh, so I'd like to transition into some of the questions we've gotten from the public. And I apologize in advance. There has been so much interest in all of the work that <coughs> we uh, project. So I don't think we will be able to get to all of the questions. But I do want to get to some of them. And there has been a lot of interest in relation to climate change and Puerto Rico's energy future. So how do you, what role do you see in energy distribution in mitigating the impacts of climate change, but also how will the intensity and frequency of storms that will come in subsequent years, the, the very likely possibility that we will face another Maria, how will uh, a distributed energy system or the energy system that we have today interact with this reality. Well, might I take that? Um, I, since I specialize in a lot of emergency preparedness, I have a very loud New York voice, so I, I, I'm not sure. Thank you for the recording. Oh, for the recording. Um, I think I need that one now. Um, uh, so um, the issue is what, just like we have, what, what happened in the transformation of communications is we got away from copper wire, and we use cell towers, fiber optics, satellites. And if a cell tower goes down, you know, service doesn't stop. They automatically triangulate and get you your communication. Well, except when it's old enough now. I'll get to that in a second. And then in, in the internet, data centers drop down every, every week. I power data centers. I know all about this. And they don't stop. The internet doesn't go down. They, the other data centers triangulate around it and work around it. What we need to do here, because Puerto Rico is going to have more intense weather patterns, as the rest of the world is, is to have segmented systems. Now, you can do that on a larger grid wire sy sy system, and that's using sectionalizers and reclosers, where if parts of the grid fail, the other parts of the grid that are operating, in fact, shut off from the rest of the grid and just do a, a, a designated area so the whole system doesn't have a domino effect and everybody's sitting there out without power. But more importantly, within those sections, we need microgrids with energy storage so that the same thing can happen. The idea is self-healing <coughs> grids. They're happening all over this damn planet now. We're in a, in a change like we had with cellular and the internet. This is sort of the third way. And we're going to catch up and do that. And so, does the technology exist? Yes. Are we in adolescence with it? Yes. We have a lot to learn. But is it getting better every damn day? Yes. So that's the goal. And we need actors, which is why I love you even without the beard, that are willing to take <laughs> the challenge to create these local projects, integrating these technologies in, to really pave the way. So with that, I wanted to, and I teach this in a course. So. No, there you go. This, this is great. I like going in reverse order now because I can just say what he said. Um, the, uh, you don't want to sink that low. <laughs> he's right about TikTok. So one of the things that qualifies me to have as much sort of knowledge about Puerto Rico, as, as some people know, is uh, in 2012, 2013, after I left the private equity group that I helped found, uh, I did some work on a national energy security study uh, for the DNI. It's not confidential, so I'm not revealing anything. But one of the things that we did at the time, and uh, with one of the colleagues who I actually see here in the room, but I want to identify him, uh, we, we looked at Puerto Rico and its vulnerability to natural disasters. And as a system, looking at, you know, frankly, such poor general design, I mean, you had a, basically a, an electricity system designed for uh, maybe the middle of Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> Maybe not, they do have tornadoes there. But, uh, and, and so you had extreme vulnerabilities from right after the end of the line. And part of it was looking at it as something that really could happen. And if it did happen, what it was going to look like from an energy security standpoint was like a you know electromagnetic pulse attack or a, uh, a you know, solar flare over a large area of the country where you know, the whole system goes down and you can't start it back up again. right? Um, by the way, 
TP did not mention, but that one unit at the hydroelectric station was the unit they used to restart the whole damn grid. Yep. Right. One generator, six megawatts, that actually lifted after a gran apagón. Everybody probably has had family that went through the Gran Apagón three days. Why? Because a distribution center of the component caught fire, and then because of the antiquated system, the whole island went down. And it is so ironic that the only Black Star capability in Puerto Rico was this uncared for, unmaintained, single six megawatt generator that restarted the island. That's true strategic capacity, and that's also an example of true blindness. When you want to let the one resource that can restart the island by simply opening a valve and start generating electrons to restart the island. A lot of people don't even know that story. <coughs> so the, the last point that I want, and it's actually right, the last point I wanted to make is back in 2013 when we were talking about national energy security, and this is far beyond Puerto Rico, it's just cyber, it's just everything. Um, we were talking then about the self-healing grid, right? And looking at being able to, you know, open breakers and close breakers on, on small areas and have them be sustainable. You know, we can use the terms nano grids, micro grids, mini grids, regional grids. We really actually need to adopt some real nomenclature associated with that. But the, the fact is, is that this is the direction that Puerto Rico is headed. Right? That is not a question. Right? This is baked into the discussions of the resources plan. And how you start by divide, being able to divide up the uh, distribution resources of, uh, of the island and move generation out into uh, the communities and have, you know, whether it's 8, 10, 12, 13, 18, depending on who you ask, different independent regions that can run for a significant period of time, if not forever, in a disconnected capacity. And the technology, back in 2013, I mean, they were only beginning to think about things like micro-synchro phases. And for those of you, I'm not a tech guy, but this is not a name I know. This is the ability, very important ability, to take different areas off the grid and bring them back on the grid rapidly and easily without you know, creating a lot of losses or problems. Typically, when you're just syncing or desynchronizing an area from the grid, there's a huge amount of, of potential risk in terms of realigning the you know, frequencies, right? So this actually now today can be done with relative ease. Absolutely. Right? And, and automatically, with very little oversight. So the technology is there. It's still a little on the expensive side, but not crazy. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm going to ask Involving local Puerto Rican communities, so we just, as a form of wrapping up, would love to hear about how you're working already with local communities and um, what can folks in the public do. Um, they can go back to their local communities and um, execute. So, you should stop. You're the most local, so you should. <laughs> <laughs> well, for one, I'm working with these guys. <laughs> That's all. Um, and uh, and have been uh, in in the the, the programs that, uh, that we're talking about. First of all, we're a brand new nonprofit. We started in the middle of last year, and finally, <laughs> thank you, IRS and Donald Trump, finally got the five hundred one c three certification last month. Whoa. So, um, you know, we, we have it all to do. Uh, we were able to, to secure the grant. Um, so it's very important, as you know, um, that, uh, that my own team, basically, in Puerto Rico, uh, there are a couple of exceptions, and some of the experts and people that we'll bring in um, will not be. But the, the program that we're talking about in terms of reaching out to local communities, we're uh, going to be going out a little later um, well, from the beginning of next month, uh, announcing the, the program and uh, working into uh, local municipalities and others. And it will be you know, through through people like CP and his group and the, the people, uh, board members and others, and the, the hires we're going to be making specifically to be able to reach out into those communities and be able to present this direct back. We're also planning to uh, it'll probably end up being in January uh, after the 6th. Um, <laughs> Uh, do a, a road trip out uh, of probably five or six locations around the island to talk about the programs. 
to, to reach out to make sure that people know. And then, again, through the process of this program, the cohort members will benefit, the community should, but as we bring people down and have regional training sessions for the cohort members, we generally intend to hold a, you know, at least a, a two-hour public session free, allowing people to, to come in and you know, find them with a Jigger Shaw has told me he's going to come down with me. Um, so I uh, hope to, to get him down there. Um, you know, honestly, he may send Jacob or one of his other guys, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll get it done. Yeah. I, I think the, the issue I have, you know, I'm in this field for 40 years, and um, I have a lot of projects on every continent, including Antarctica. And um, <laughs> my, my biggest concern in Puerto Rico is um, I get calls every week from Puerto Rico. And we need, as a family, to, and, and, and over half are local governments, and they're just, they're desperate for reliable energy, mostly related to services, water, communications, of course, electricity, um, you know, gasoline pump islands, you know, all the things that are really important to keep going. And we, and usually it's one ridiculous little fact that they need to get to the next step or contact. And we need to create, among the broader family, a, what I call a rapid response approach so we can empower people to either hook up to great, these great folks or others so they can meet a need or answer a question to somebody in a party so they can get to the next step. So I see this as sort of uh, an agile information approach and then, frankly, when you have a project, and, it hope, and it, even if you can get around the bureaucracy, and you can with distributed energy, um, attract capital and other resource and expertise to make it happen and in real time. Plus, I know, uh, unlike you, I'm not getting any younger. So you want to make things happen while we have the time. And I'm just finding I'm getting these random calls several a week. Uh, you know, it's been a while now since the hurricane hurricanes, and um, it, it, it hurts my soul. So we have to figure out a way, uh, a more agile way, a purposeful way, to make this happen. It just, I just wanted to intersect. There's a, there's, and there's an easy way to do this, right, with, with, uh, with social media. Um, one of the things I've seen that's been very successful so far within the island is uh, one of my board members, uh, Gabriel Perez, uh, Blue Planet Energy, uh, has been involved in Aguaner, uh, which is kind of the Contractors Association of Renewable Energy on the island. And uh, he, set, he just set up a WhatsApp group. He just invited a bunch of people called the Instaladores de Puerto Rico, and it's, it's primarily aimed at you know, solar and other types of installers. But that particular WhatsApp channel is is lit up every day, yeah. and um, you know you could create several others off that to, to focus on, on separate different you know items. But you know we've talked about uh, you know regulatory and permit issues on there, all the way down to hey, does anybody know who sells sun power panels on the app? Right, and it's automatic, but it's a response, a few minutes time. Right, he's got about 130, 140. You know, we could do, it gets a little unwieldy if you get too many more people. That could be an easy, cheap freeway to get started. Well, a little listservs and websites, sure. Thank you so much for all of you for participating in this conversation. Like I said, I'm sure that we can get to all your questions, but uh, it just goes to show that the work that you're doing is so important and so impactful, and that there is audience members that are standing ready to learn more and to go back into their communities and build a more resilient energy grid for Puerto Rico. So thank you.